1918 Education Commission by Dr. Paul Wanyeki. Welcome to our today's lecture. Kenya has a long and rich history of Education Commission. In this lecture, we are going to look at the second Education Commission in Kenya. This was commissioned in 1918 and was to address challenges in the education that were brought by World War I. At the request of Mr. Orr, the education director in the country, the acting governor, Sir Charles Calvert Boring, appointed an education commission in 1918. The commission term of reference was to establish the background state of education of all races in Kenya. The commission sought submissions from interested parties and this is what was submitted to the commission. One, the whites and Asians were concerned about improving education qualities in their schools. The director of education, Mr. Orr, made a case for education for Africans. This was so because the existing education system was not producing competent labor for the agricultural sector and light industries for the British settlers. Submission number three was that government to give more support to education, especially on self-appointed school committees. It should be noted that even after the recommendation of a Fraser Commission, grant in aid was not implemented. And therefore, in this commission, still the submission is coming up that government to give more support on education, especially on self-appointed committees. Also important to note is that none of the interested parties presented to the commission that government should take over existing missionary schools. The commission recommendations. Recommendation number one. The commission recommended the provision of African education to remain a major responsibility of the missionaries. However, government should increase its role in financing the provision of education. Commendation number two was grant in aid not to be distributed based on examination achievement but on student enrollment. This was because in African schools, achievement in examination was very low and to make matters worse, progression rate was very low due to very high dropout rates. The third recommendation was that a daily routine be established in African schools. The next recommendation was that the commission recommended that secular government schools could not be successful without proper religious and moral instruction and thus African education should be provided by missionary societies. Actually, for African education, it was religious education that was being offered supplemented by vocational and technical education. The other recommendation was that gospel of work be emphasized. Actually, according to Jesse Jones, working with the soil was working with God and also the gospel of salvation be emphasized. The gospel of salvation was that Africans were to submit to the white authority without questioning, since the authority was God established, failure to which they will go to hell, since they are to fight for their salvation. Now, to this point, I ask this loaded question. Just a question which is food for thought. By the government advocating for teaching of morality through definite religious studies, 
curriculum in basic and secondary education through the national goal of education number four, which states as follows, promote sound morals and religious value. Question number one, is the government not promoting the colonial agenda of racism? Debate. Question number two, just like the colonial government, is the government using religious studies to develop good laborers and good Christians, but not intellectual thinking human beings who might question and start to oppose poor government policies? Discuss the disposition. Question number three. Is government using religious studies to assault undesirable qualities like self-concept and insolence in people brought by literate education and exposure that support critical thinking debate. Commission implementation. These are the implementation of the recommendation of the 1918 commission. Number one was a daily routine was established and it was followed to the latter. In the routine, it is noted that the number of minutes for handcraft and building exceeded reading, writing, and arithmetic combined. The number of hours for handcraft and building was 600. For arithmetic, 240. For writing, 200. And for reading, approximately 145. And combined, they were less than the total number for handcraft and building. Also to be noted, most of the schools at that time were residential. Students lived in the schools, and this was for the purpose of discipline and indoctrination, not teaching, indoctrination in terms of religious study or the gospel of salvation and gospel of work. The emphasis was on manual work rather than on literacy education. Becca Bell, the district commissioner of South Nyeri in 1934, proudly pointed out that even the artisans were poorly prepared for the job. This means that the goals of the colonial education were being met or were being overachieved. The second recommendation or the second implementation of the recommendation was that grant in aid system was established to help mission schools only after the nine after 1918 and this is a picture of an ancient building at Maseno school that was established in 1906 from the support of the grants implied goals of african education in 1918 the first goal was to convert africans to Christianity. The second goal was to train elementary practical skills in selected crafts in selected crafts to Africans. Goal number three, to produce cheap labor to the colonial government and to the European settler community so as to replace expensive Asian labor. Goal number four, to produce a less academic, empowered African who would be less vocal on matters politics. Goal number five, to produce a semi-educated labor force to develop the colony economy and to provide chiefs and headsmen to help in administration. Goal number seven, to discredit African traditional training method, and they termed them or labeled African traditioning method as uncivilized. Goal number eight, to discipline Africans through industrial education, agriculture, and manual labor. Facts that influence colonial education policy development during the colonial era, as recorded by Sheffield 1973. Factor number one. Conflict between the needs of the settler economy 
based on plantation agriculture and British industrial needs. There was conflict of whether to produce technicians who will work in British industries or to produce artisans at vocational level to work at plantations. Conflict number two. Conflict among foreign interests based on colonial desires to modernize Africa versus the African determination to preserve their custom, culture, and traditions. Africans wanted to preserve their culture, while colonialists wanted to modernize the country, and there was a conflict. Conflict number three, the challenge of devising an education system to provide a relevant education to Africans that would make them good laborers and good Christians, but not intelligent thinking human beings who might question and start to oppose the colonial regime. Actually, that was a major conflict because they wanted someone to assist them, work in their industry, work in their farm, but they wanted the same person to, to remain illiterate and be efficient. That was a major conflict. Interesting to note was that Lord Delamere, who was favoring minority rule and was a white supremacist, was the representative in the Central Advisory Committee on African Education in Nairobi. And in a process that it is believed was led by Lord Delamere, he asked 18 settlers in Lemuru to respond to the following question. Will you give your views of native educations? And this is what they had to say. One, to be considered only after provision for European education is complete. Number two, agri-industrial education or trade apprenticeship to be offered to the Africans. Number three, African education to be centered on cultural apprenticeship. Number four, Africans to be taught to work. That is the gospel of work or the discipline of work. Number five, that Africans to be taught the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. But in reality, there are four R's, and the fourth silent R was the emphasis, religion. Number six, Africans to be taught morality and honesty. Number seven, Africans to be taught cleanliness and hygiene. Number eight, Africans to be taught religious education. And number nine, Africans to be taught how to develop the country. This greatly shaped educational policies during colonial era. Philosophical foundations for educational policies in Kenya in the 1920s. Foundation number one to create a small semi-illiterate indigenous population of good Christians, and especially during the interwar period, that is, during the World War I. Colonialists feared that the World War I might enlighten Africans, and they might rise up and start fighting for liberation. And therefore, they wanted an education system that will create good Christians who will accommodate the white role. Philosophy number two, or philosophical foundation number two. To educate Africans through a village-oriented agriculture and skill-based curriculum. This is what was called education for rural development or education for adaptation. Impact of religious education during colonial era. Impact number one. Religious education created a separating barrier between the old 
who are grounded in African culture and tradition and the young who are adopting the European culture, making the young homeless in mind and in spirit. Impact number two. The religion made Africans lose continuity, aim, and force in their culture and society and self-esteem. Impact number three. The gospel of work emphasized the dignity of labor and habits of industry so as to disdain helplessness and idleness in the Africans. Impact number three. Religious education emphasized discipline or go to burn in fires of hell and inculcated humility and submission to authority in Africans. Thank you for joining us in this lesson and I welcome you to our next lesson which will be on education in a stratified society.